Uh, I'm very honored to be here with uh, such a distinguished panel. I'd like to introduce each person very quickly, and then we'll kick things off with a question for each of them. Uh, first to my left, Jovan uh, Georginski was the uh, chief of mission for Macedonia in the United Nations. He also uh, was the chair of the uh, panel looking into autonomous lethal weapons and uh, ways that we can combat uh, uh, some of the risks to autonomous uh, lethal, lethal weapons. Uh, to his left is uh, one of the legendary investigative reporters in the United States, Michael Isakoff, who's currently chief investigative reporter for Yahoo News. Uh, we're also very, very honored to have uh, Dr. Hessa al -Jaber. Uh She's the former Minister for Communications and Technology for the state of Qatar. And at the end, uh, J.D. Maddox, uh, he's a consultant to the State Department, to the CIA, an expert on uh, technology and disinformation, a professor at George Mason University. Thank you all so much for, uh, for coming and joining our panel. Uh, Jovan, I want to start with you uh, because as we've heard all day today, uh, the problem of disinformation can be both a very immediate, life-threatening, state-to-state uh, question of war. It can also be something that's quite insidious, that sort of affects a culture and affects people's perceptions of things. You should tell us, uh, when we deal with uh, artificial intelligence, with autonomous lethal weapons, how does disinformation, uh, combined with those new technologies, uh, that's something that keeps you up at night. <laughs> and you should tell us why. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and I think that this is the, perhaps one of the key aspects that we have to cover uh, today. And if many of the discussions have so far focused and may focus over the next two days on internal dynamics and perhaps ways that uh, those internal dynamics may be influenced by this information, uh, this is something that has been done throughout history, as, been, as has been mentioned. There is something qualitatively dif different about the technologies used but there's also something qualitatively different in the other technologies that are allowing for a different kind of warfare. So I've been privileged this year to chair the group of governmental experts on lethal autonomous weapon systems, but also last year I chaired the Biological Weapons Convention, and I saw in both um, how destructive this information can be in, in such an international context, because it really targets the, 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 the framework of international relations. Uh, this year, in, uh, for instance, in autonomous weapons, there is a frame of uh, it putting it all under the rubric of killer robots. And, you know, killer robots is a very easy way of looking at it. But the discussion is actually much more complex. Uh, and it really requires a, a, a lot of greater detail in, into, into how it is approached. There was, for instance, uh, a civil society video that was made. So this was in good intent of, of trying to uh, imagine what killer robots would look like. This was uh, a, a made-up video. But I've, what I've seen is that many take parts of that. And there are parts in that video that are made realistic, like this is really happening. Like the, uh, so there are actors who take segments of it and have released it as if, it, as if this is really happening. I saw last year as well, in the, as I chair the Biological Weapons Convention, such disinformation campaigns that are spread in terms of that there are actors who are designing genetically specific weapons to target a given race or a given ethnicity. Now, thinking about this, you know, if, if a biological weapons to be used between major wars would be something that is done, done over a long period of time, it would not be used. And let me not get into why I don't think that that is the case. But the fact that it is put in the public narrative in such a way, it really attacks and creates a lot of distrust that can be the seed for further uh, conflict. So there is this information that can be done in such a, um, uh, let's say, a, a state-centered uh, uh, or, or community-centered environment. But there is this, in, this information that I think is very, very dangerous with, when it is included in such weapons of mass destruction as, as what I'm uh, talking about here. So it's very important to be able to clearly convey intent and to be able to read intent in the actors of others when it comes to diplomacy in general and specifically when it comes to really strategic issues that involve weapons of mass destruction. And if that fabric is influenced in some way, as it has been, 
uh, the, 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 the repercussions can be uh, quite um, uh, uh, dangerous to, 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 to uh, all of us. So I think that it is very uh, important that we pay special attention uh, in terms of first being able to keep the multilateral fora that allow for the communication, that allow for the actors to be able to um, read each other and to be able to convey intent. Because when that starts breaking up, then this information can have much more of an impact when everybody kind of goes back into their garages and imagines the intent of others. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but I think that it is a very important way of looking at those strands of international relations and the fact that they're built on trust and that this information can attack directly in the center of them. Thank you. Um, Michael, we, uh, we in the United States, <laughs> we in the United States uh, have experienced in the last like 10 years, the rise of conspiracy theories of truths. Uh, those of us who go out and talk to voters at various points are often quite shocked at some of the things that people are coming back with and where they get information. It, it really is something that, that wakes you up if you've been in the news business for as many uh, decades as we have. <laughs> Uh, you have made sort of a recent focus of your career uh, studying the Russian interference of the, in the 2016 election, but also, uh, you know, one conspiracy theory through your podcast, sort of the anatomy of a conspiracy theory. Uh, what did you come away from uh, thinking about that? Is, is this a problem that's never going to go away, or is this yeah. something that we can get our arms around? No, I, I think it's an existential problem for all of us, um, and particularly those of us in the news business. I want to tell two stories. Uh, um, uh, one, because we're in the Middle East, is a, is a story that arises out of the Middle East. The predicate for disinformation uh, is to discredit real information. Um, and so, uh, a few years ago, actually February 2017, uh, I had an opportunity to um, interview Bashar al-Assad in Damascus. And um, I wanted to use this interview as an, uh, a, a chance to confront him uh, about uh, some of the horrific human rights abuses of his regime. Uh, it so happened that the day of the interview, uh, Amnesty International had just released a report on Sibnaya prison and the mass uh, executions of political dissidents at the prison. I also took with him, with me, uh, when I did the interview, um, photographs of the uh, of uh, copies of the Caesar photos. I don't know if how many of you remember these, but Caesar was the code name for a uh, regime photographer who uh, worked in uh, the military prisons in Syria and photographed, took these just horrific photos of emaciated, uh, uh, um, bruised and tortured prisoners that when you look at them, they are smack out of the, uh, out of the Holocaust. And in fact, they've been shown at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Um, and um, Hassad had never been uh, confronted about these. Um, in this interview, I asked him, confronted him about both the Sinaya prison uh, report and the, um, and the photos, and his response, was so interesting, um, uh, what he said to me was, you can fake anything these days, we are living in a fake news era. Um, and that was the first time that somebody overseas had used the rhetoric of Donald Trump um, uh, to respond to questions about his own regime. Uh, Fake news. Uh, there to hear that from Assad um, talking about uh, in in a way to discredit real news. Uh, and since then, um, uh, we've seen other uh, autocrats around the world adopt this language. There was a time that America used to export uh, our values of democracy, freedom of the press, freedom of expression, um, and uh, here we've seen uh, the exportation of the language uh, that really you know, sows the seeds for, um, for disinformation. Um, Peter mentioned, uh, and this is my second story, uh, uh, conspiracy theories how they work. I did do a uh, extensive investigation for a six-part podcast uh, we called Conspiracy Land uh, that we released over the summer um, about the Seth Rich case. Seth Rich 
uh, was a 27-year-old who worked for the Democratic National Committee who was uh, tragically murdered on the streets of Washington July 10th, 2016 uh, in what police uh, quickly um, uh, concluded was uh, uh, a botched robbery. But the story of his death took on this life of its own where it became the basis for a conspiracy theory that Seth Rich was the leaker of the DNC emails to WikiLeaks. It was not the Russians, it was Seth Rich who did it. Uh, and, um, and that he was then murdered as a consequence to um, shut him up. Um, this conspiracy theory got so much traction, um, starting out in obscure websites that you've never heard of, uh, migrating to 4chan and Reddit chat rooms, to then gets picked up by Roger Stone, a uh, longtime political advisor dirty trickster for Donald Trump. Uh, Julian Assange fuels it um, uh, by talking at one point a few weeks later, announcing he's, uh, uh, WikiLeaks has a reward for information about Seth Rich's murder. And then it goes from there to the highest levels of the Trump White House. Uh, Steve Bannon uh, is telling reporters, and we have text messages from him, it was a contract kill, obviously, and uh, before too long, in May of 2017, it's being shouted from the rooftops on Fox News. Sean Hannity is, um, uh, is, uh, is pounding it night after night for a, a one-week period. Um, this was, a, it is, a, a, a sort of a case study of how this works, and where did it start? This is what's so interesting. In, in our investigation, we, um, we tracked down the former fe the federal prosecutor who was in charge of the investigation into the actual murder of Seth Rich. She was so alarmed by these bizarre conspiracy theories about the subject of her investigation that she goes to the U.S. intelligence community and says, I need to know where is all this coming from? And um, what she got back was three days after Seth Rich's death, July 13th. Um, before this was really on the radar screen of, any, of anybody, the Russian SVR, their version of the CIA, had planted a fake intelligence bulletin saying that Seth Rich was gunned down by a squad of assassins working for Hillary Clinton. Um, at the time, this only goes up on this very obscure website called whatdoesitmean.com. You could look it up. It's a pretty uh, transparently a vehicle for Russian propaganda. Um, but it becomes the start of this migration that I talked about in which a bizarre, completely baseless conspiracy theory um, uh, escalates and ends up uh, in the living rooms of millions of Americans uh, who are watching Fox News at night. Um, it's uh, a really a tragic story. It's a tragic story for the family, the parents of Seth Rich who had to under, uh, undergo this, but it gives you some uh, uh, insight into how this works and how a little, with a little boost from a foreign government, uh, which had its own obvious interests, um, uh, you can propagate a conspiracy theory that gets widespread traction. And I should only say, the rele relevance of this right now is, look at the transcript of President Trump's phone call with President Zelensky. Before he gets to the Hunter Biden, Joe Biden part of the ask, what's he talking about? Ukraine, finding that DNC server, what's it all about proving that the Russians didn't do it, it was somebody else that hacked the DNC, stole those emails, and gave them to WikiLeaks. And the prime candidate for that has always been in the, uh, in the conspiracy world, this kid, Seth Rich. Um, thank you, Michael, for that uh, sobering presentation. Uh, having heard from Jivan and Michael uh, some of the uh, 
dimensions of the problem. Uh, I want to focus with our, our last two guests to start off uh, on, on some potential uh, solutions. Uh, the problems that Michael described obviously are not uh, specific to the United States. All, all cultures are wrestling with this. Uh, there's been a shift away from trusted news outlets to social media in almost every country in the world. Um, Hesse, as the former Minister for Technology and Communications, what can a country, what can a government do to lessen the risk of fake news, disinformation, getting into the national bloodstream? Uh, Qatar's been a victim of this, but what, what can be done? Yeah, I think uh, maybe uh, in the beginning, let me uh, share with you uh, some statistics that, that are very uh, critical related to this area. Uh, there is a very good report that was published in September by uh, Oxford University. And in this report, and, uh, they indicate that 70 countries are using uh, uh, social media for 100% uh, share uh, disinformation. And uh, the way they are using it, 87% uh, uh, they are using uh, human to do this. 80% uh, they are using pot to do, uh, to, do uh, to do this. And uh, around 11% they are using both. And uh, Qatar has been one of the victims of this uh, fake or of this uh, disinformation uh, that's been floating all over the world. When it comes to how a government can deal with this, and I think, uh, and I'd like maybe to focus for, when it, for MENA region, uh, social media is so accessible. More than 154 million in uh, MENA region, they have, uh, I, mean they, I mean, they are uh, Facebook uh, subscribers. And Facebook is number one when it comes to just according to Oxford report, they are number one when it comes to distribute uh, disinformation because it's easy, it's very, uh, يعني, uh, anyone can access it. Also, if, if you think about it now, to, access, to uh, share any uh, disinformation, you really don't need anything. You need a computer and you need an access to unregulated uh, social media that you can share with it anything. You can use technology to make sure that whatever you will be writing will, uh, will, uh, يعني, will be replicated and uh, will be shared. What government uh, can do, I think uh, we can do three things. Number, يعني, I'm a big believer in with law and regulation. I know that uh, I, I will not go to something extreme like uh, some countries when they have, uh, يعني, they just issue law some of a uh, of, uh, neighbor country or some in the, uh, in the Asian country where any miss or any disinformation that will be uh, spread using social media, they will go for one million uh, dollar uh, fee uh, penalty plus up to 10 years of uh, uh, prison. Uh, but we, we need a form of uh, law and regu regulation where 100% uh, people will be, uh, because no matter how uh, we will claim that, uh, we will uh, encourage the ethic, we will encourage the values, we will encourage the, I do believe that the, uh, uh, having strong law and regu regulation where countries will, uh, will be uh, well implemented and uh, uh, everybody should, uh, يعني, should follow this law. Uh, number two, and uh, usually when it comes to, and, and, and I know in so many countries, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in, in France, even in the uh, US, there is a kind of policy or regulation which will prevent, at least when it comes to privacy. But one thing we should make sure that whenever there is a law, we will not touch the freedom of uh, expression because I think this is where there is very uh, fine uh, line between having uh, strict law and uh, not touching the uh, freedom of expression. The second thing I think, uh, and, and this is 
not country, it's the uh, social media companies, and that's what they are doing when it comes to Facebook, when it comes to uh, Twitter, when it comes, 100% they should be, and, and I know that they are having number of algorithm, number of AI, very sophisticated uh, system that uh, uh, maybe uh, not now, but maybe in the future will be able to detect even this deep fake uh, mis uh, disinformation or, uh, or uh, other things. The third things, which I think is very important, it's about teaching uh, media literacy. I know uh, Northwestern Dean is here with us. I'm a big believer that media literacy and critical things, thinking is very, very critical. It is where individual uh, user will just question. I mean, is this right? Uh, does, I would say, uh, like the two um, video that had been shown uh, for uh, uh, President Obama, I think uh, if somebody will ask themselves, is it real that uh, somebody will, 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 uh, will be like this? So, uh, so it's about the three things, regulation, uh, that is uh, government uh, obligation. Uh, when it comes to uh, technical solution, it's the social media obligation. And when it comes to uh, media literacy, 100%, it's something that we should teach it in our school, in our uh, university. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Hessa. Those are uh, many important ideas that we can go back to and uh, discuss in a second. But first, I wanted to, uh, to ask uh, uh, JD, this is a uh, technology problem. Is there a technology solution that we can look to? Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. And uh, good luck to the Qatari soccer team this evening against Oman, by the way. Um, I'd like to take a step back um, and just explain where I'm coming from. I'm a consultant to the Global Engagement Center, which is the U.S.'s effort to uh, more efficiently coordinate its counter-propaganda, counter-disinformation efforts. We uh, have taken a, a step back um, to look at this problem and think through uh, really useful solutions. So I'm going to give you some very specific solutions today that are immediately applicable to this problem in a concrete way. So each of us is really assailed by thousands of points of information that effectively influence our activities each day. Um, and the internet represents the consolidation of many of these points of information, points of influence in our lives. And it offers an unusual opportunity for our adversaries uh, to get at those points of influence and points of information uh, in a consolidated way. Um, and so what we've seen over the last few years, very specifically, uh, as was previously mentioned, um, Oxford University recently came out with a study that uh, at least 70 states have used disinformation in uh, campaigns against foreign states. Uh, one example is uh, the Chinese efforts in Hong Kong. Uh, Twitter recently released statistics that they uncovered 936 extremely active accounts um, coming out of the Chinese Republic, uh, which were really the core of a group of about 200,000 accounts uh, also focused on that area. In 2018, Twitter uh, released or uh, uh, announced that it had shut down about three million pieces of disinformation uh, or postings uh, that were emanated from terrorist organizations. Uh, and in 2017, uh, it was announced that on Facebook and Instagram, at least 30 million people had interacted with uh, information that had come out of the uh, internet research agency in Russia. Um, so this is a very real problem and it's only going to get more complex as technologies such as deepfakes come online. As, as an example, uh, in the last few weeks, a uh, company called DeepTrace uh, released a set of data indicating that they had found at least 15,000 examples of deepfakes out on the internet. 98% of these were really focused on uh, pornography, um, but 2% were focused on corporate leaders and undermining their, their authority. Um, 
Intrinsic to this problem is a psychological disposition that all of us have, which limits our ability to discern between fact and fiction online. And there are really two major uh, assessments of this problem. One is either we're extraordinarily intellectually lazy or we're simply limited in the amount of information that we can consume and understand. In either case, the solution seems to be uh, finding better ways to engage critically with the information that we're consuming. There are a number of ways to go after the problem. I'm focused on technology because that's how I'm consulting to the Global Engagement Center, but of course we could also consider regulatory, educational, narrative approaches to this problem. But I'm going to get into some technological solutions very specifically. Um, first is web-enabled literacy training such as games that take individuals through the process of discerning between fact and fiction in a fun way. This is important because it ha each of these things has to be very engaging. These games, or at least one of them, has uh, claimed that they have a, uh, uh, the ability to increase users' discernment between fact and fiction by 8%. Dark web monitoring tools, we need to be able to find disinformation campaigns as they're moving through the environment, uh, the tools to get disinformation campaigns started sometimes are available on the dark web. So we're interested in dark web monitoring tools that allow us to see where that, those campaigns are coming from. Censorship circumvention tools. When states shut down the internet, we would like to find tools that enable individuals to continue to consume useful information. Social listening, this has been the bread and butter of this industry for quite some time. Social listening typically is used to find narratives as they're erupting on the internet, um, but, but it's also, also useful for uh, finding the origins and attribution of disinformation as it's erupting. Web annotation, a new tool, uh, is useful for having conversations on top of uh, any content that's on the internet. So for example, if al-Baghdadi issues a video, you could have a conversation right on top of that video uh, debunking what he's saying. Crowdsource content assessments. Uh, this is similar to what Microsoft was presenting today with NewsGuard. This enables uh, a crowd of people to make a judgment on the underlying uh, uh, certainty of the information that you're consuming. So they will look into sourcing, credibility, things like that. They're not looking into the content itself. And blockchain-based content validation, we will hear from uh, TruePick, I think, tomorrow. Um, we think this technology is particularly interesting because essentially it fingerprints video or other content and then stores it on the blockchain, making it immutable. And finally, um, I'd like to show you how we're trying to move this, these technologies into, from concept to actual implementation. We have a tech demo series uh, going every two weeks in DC. We've gone through about 60 different technologies, and we have uh, every US agency under the sun there, as well as foreign partners, and you're invited. Our tech challenges, these are overseas. We're applying funding to specific technologies in support of foreign governments to get those technologies working concretely. A good example is putting a social listening tool uh, to work in support of the UK government against Russian disinformation uh, earlier this year. And finally, the uh, technology testbed, which is our opportunity to identify technologies and put them through rapid testing against specific uh, challenges. And we offer to our government partners and to our foreign partners the opportunity to nominate these uh, challenges, and we will take those challenges and uh, attempt to uh, run tests against them. And finally, all this information is generally available on disinfocloud.com. If you have a .mil or .gov account, you're uh, uh, able to get in there. And that's us. We're open for business. Uh, thank you very much, J.D., and uh, I'll ask a few questions, but I have, want to invite our, our panelists to, to jump in on the conversation if there are things you want to uh, comment on. Um, J.D., you've done a, a good job of sort of identifying ways in which we can spot the problem. Uh, what are the solutions? I mean, just labeling on the Internet, at least anecdotally, there's some belief that that doesn't work. 
that it doesn't really solve things. If you say this is a distrusted outlet, people don't care. If you put something next to it that contradicts it, people still absorb the fake news along with the real news. Um, does, does the Global Engagement Center have an actual policy in how to root this stuff out? Well, what we found over the years is that refuting content or debunking content on a one-to-one -one basis is not very efficient. Um, it's, a, it's essentially a rabbit hole, um, and it's hard to get out of it. Um, instead, what we're looking for are opportunities to um, uh, initiate critical thinking by audiences in a way that allows them to overcome the sort of nonsense that's going on there. And the, the technologies that I've highlighted today are potentially useful if they are put uh, into systems where they're passively used by uh, information consumers. So, you know, we've seen plenty of, um, uh, 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 crowd, you know, um, crowdsourced um, information um, systems, but if they're, if the information consumer is required to go in and use that system proactively, they're just not going to do it. The system has to be passive and it has to be used at scale. And that's really a difficult problem. I was really happy to see Microsoft implementing some tools that enable us to potentially scale those up uh, internationally. Hesse, you, you mentioned, yes, you mentioned media literacy uh, instruction. Uh, is there any evidence that that works either? Uh, uh, having a media literacy class? Yeah, yeah, I thought I need, I mean, I mean since we are talking about tool, I thought it, it was worth it to mention that in Qatar we have uh, QCRR, uh, Qatar Computer Research Center, and Dr. Ahmed is here. I just like to thank him for, they are having, because especially when it comes to the Arabic language, we really need a different tool to detect that this is uh, false news. So they have very uh, good, uh, uh, very sophisticated system. It's Tembi, and Tembi, and Tembi it's where, uh, where any news or, or uh, in Arabic they can go through it, and they will be able to kind of uh, detect, because they will check the source, they will check the uh, methodology, they will check the, and, and, uh, and it's one of the best, so my assumption it's the only Arabic system that, uh, that exists. When it comes to media literacy, uh, I, I know that there are structure program for media literacy, uh, literacy and I know that even here in, uh, in uh, Qatar, we, uh, in uh, K-12, we are having some kind of, uh, of kind of awareness and, uh, and uh, for students to critical thinking when, whenever they will see a news. Because I think, especially uh, for Qatar, for the past uh, two, two years since the blockade happening, the only things uh, you are reading in a daily basis is this disinformation. I think we have been overwhelmed with a with, uh, lot of fake and inaccurate uh, information. And uh, WhatsApp is number one when it comes how people are uh, sharing uh, this information, and you will be surprised that a lot of young, and uh, they are the one who will emphasize, no, you should uh, uh, find out the, uh, the uh, real resource, and they've been using tool, existing tool like Tembi or uh, other tool to do this. Michael, I might say, traditionally, those of us in the media are uh, very, very, very wary of government interference in the free exchange of information. Uh, we've heard some suggestions uh, from Hessa and uh, to a lesser extent from JD that, that may intrude in that, uh, in that area. Um, in the case that you investigated, the Seth Rich case, the Seth Rich family has sued Fox News. Normally we would hope for uh, the news organization to win because we don't want to see a lot of case law developing that limits news organizations. In this case, though, are you, are you rooting for the rich family, and do you think that the <laughs> government should be doing more in the United States yeah. uh, to crack down on some of these practices, um, Yeah, well, bad I, media practices? I, yeah, um, rooting for is not a, a phrase I like to sort of 
adopt as a as a journalist. Um, um, but it is it is a fascinating and really tough issue. Um, uh, there are uh, there were two lawsuits that were filed out of the Seth Rich case um, that are in the actually in many lawsuits, but the two that are sort of the most interesting are, you know, one by the brother of Seth Rich, who was accused by some of these conspiracy theorists of helping to conceal evidence about his brother's death and was actually even accused of being in some way complicit um, with absolutely nothing to it. But then the family, the parents also sued Fox News. And what was Fox News's response in, in its court filings? First Amendment. This is First Amendment protected journalism. Yes, I, I should point out that Fox News was forced to retract that story um, after eight days. Um, but um, uh, its arguments from its lawyers, the, law, the distinguished law firm of Williams and Connolly, uh, was, well, yes, um, uh, our clients may have gotten something wrong, but um, it's, you know, they were pursuing a story of public interest, they've got a right to do that, and um, we can't have the courts dictating uh, to a news organization what they could publish and what they could not. Um, and uh, originally, uh, the uh, trial, the first, the district court judge uh, ruled in favor of Fox News and dismissed the case. But just recently, just last month, uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals reversed that ruling uh, and reinstated the, uh, uh, the family's lawsuit against Fox News. And I think um, this one is going to be a really interesting test case of um, uh, our freedom of the press values clashing with the alarm we all feel about the um, spread of fake news and completely groundless conspiracy theories. Uh, I think the facts in this case are so egregious of the way uh, Fox News handled that story, the people who, who where they got it from, uh, the political interests of the people where they got it from. Uh, there's also a plenty of reason to think the White House may have helped stoke the matter. So um, this is definitely one uh, worth watching. Well, uh, Fox News, as you uh, described, was the sort of last organization in on this conspiracy theory. Before that, it was, it was social media and websites, uh, which are not, uh, held to libel standards. Right. So uh, Facebook, uh, which as Hesse was saying, is, is the primary source of uh, disinformation being exchanged. What would be the problem with applying the same libel standards we have in the United States for news organizations to Facebook? Facebook does, it, does not want to be viewed as a publisher. Yeah, right? they don't. That's, but, it's out. But what we're if not, we just we're did? Not, <laughs> what if we imposed a policy yeah. and decided to yeah. say, you are and a publisher? I, I think that um, yet, because they have been so, Facebook was so manipulated in the 2016 election by uh, the Internet Research a a Agency, uh, buying these phony ads from Facebooks with rubles, by the way, and yet Facebook uh, you know, was clueless about how its platform uh, was being misused to propagate false propaganda under phony names and phony accounts. Uh, that it's reacted in um, you know strong ways. They now have these you know whole units devoted to um, uh, policing the platform, to identifying um, uh, uh, malevolent actors out there who are doing this kind of stuff, and um, they are acting as censors and keeping stuff out. Well then you're acting like a publisher. And so it seems to me that their response strengthens the argument for um, uh, policing Facebook um, uh, and um, uh, reviewing how they are 
allowing what they're allowing on and off their platform. So I think uh, you know the it, it, it's ironic that the steps they've taken to correct. Um, their lapses during 2016 may ultimately lead to a lot more regulation of them. Well, that's, that's, that's an excellent point. I mean, they are regulating content to some extent. They're also making a lot of money off of advertising that right. is sold against this uh, content. Uh, so they're not a public utility. They're a private company. Um, why, why not view them as a publisher? And I'm curious what other members of the panel think about this. Uh, shouldn't there be tougher restrictions on Facebook, tougher standards? Well, I think that, you know, it, it's actually, as in most of the things that we're discussing uh, in this context, the, the context itself is much more complicated. So it was mentioned that perhaps rubles may have influenced uh, uh, a given strand of thought or a given direction. But there's another element that was present, and I know it from my own country, because a small town uh, in my country was in the center of the whole thing. Uh, a small town of Veles where young people w had uh, been trying to find money for themselves, first through Google Ads and ad clicks, uh, and they would try it first with diets and then just create viral uh, movements around that and then try this, try that. They tried with the Clinton campaign, didn't really work. So they tried around uh, the, the Trump base, or rather, more broadly, the Republican base. And it, they, their, their threads worked. So basically, they had constructed a whole infrastructure without any support from any uh, 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 foreign governments, but just based on the profit incentive that they had by creating these and having ad clicks and the money and the revenues that they were coming with. So I think that your point uh, goes well in that regard, that uh, this is something that should be regulated in a different way. And, you know, I've been involved in the internet governance debate for the past 20, 20 years or, or, or so. And I saw in the beginning how the word multilateral was a dirty word in the beginning. So companies like Microsoft, like big companies, had resisted regulation and had resisted any thought and of, of governance, of regulation. Now it is Microsoft who is pushing uh, for, for greater involvement because uh, of experience. The, it was seen how important it is to be able to regulate some of these things because it is in their, it's not in their interest to, for, for there to be a cybersecurity environment that is completely wild. So who is gonna do that if not governments? Governments are the only ones who can implement such regulations, but it has to be smart regulations based on, based on uh, trust. So I think that there is something to be said along those lines of not only, because you can regulate Facebook because it is rooted in the US, but it has influence all over the world. So how do you um, uh, regulate it in externally in other countries if legally it is rooted in the US? And then the, 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 the aspect of the legal regimes or, uh, of, of where such issues are, is covered is a very complex one, but it needs to be tackled because the alternative is a wild, wild west kind of environment. And in that kind of environment, in, 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 uh, in the absence of proper uh, legislation, it has been other bodies that have jumped in. So in the EU, for instance, in Europe broader, it has been the courts that have come in, where uh, there have been cases like the right to be forgotten by a Spanish person taken in the British uh, court that, uh, I don't know if you know the story, he was basically uh, a businessman who in the 80s went bankrupt and anybody who had done a search on him would see first that he was bankrupt. So he had uh, set up his life in a different way after that. But again and again, this search was coming up. So he took it up the case and took it in, 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 a, in a British court. He won it. And as uh, he won it, he, he, the, the right to be forgotten, he made Google erase his whole history, which made it so that Google can do it for everybody. And everybody has the right in the EU now because of the common law and because of the connection of the courts that anybody who wants to be forgotten has the right to say to Google, erase my full history. The same thing happened in Germany where there was no legislation for uh, what is called Internet of Things. So there was a, a teddy bear and such things that were uh, basically uh, a, 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 a way for pedophiles to be looking at um, babies sleeping and doing all kinds of things because there was no security on these things that was done. It was basically password, password. So a German, it was taken up in a German court and won and it made companies that are producing these kinds of toys 
produce a lot more security. So the point is, if there isn't proper legislation coming from the legislative bodies of the world or in an international forum, other bodies jump in to fill the void. But the best remains if countries do address it internally. Just to give us a sense of the stakes, uh, Javon, do you think that uh, there will be wars based on fake news that is promulgated through social media? Um, I think that even today there was a, a mention of uh, in Gabon where there was uh, 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 an attempt at a coup, an unsuccessful one. So we've already had those kinds of uh, issues. But to respond, let me say that, for instance, in the field of autonomous weapons, autonomy in weapons means autonomy in any weapon. We're not talking about just a drone. We're, it can be a weapon in land, uh, on land, in sea, underwater, in cyber, in, in, in space. We're talking about the com combination of artificial intelligence with weapons. And it has been said to be the third great revolution of, of warfare after gunpowder gun and nuclear. So the combination of that and the possibility, and let me use an extreme example of that. So autonomy, for instance, in defensive or offensive capabilities for nuclear, right? We've had at least a dozen recorded cases uh, publicly. Uh, who knows how many more there are? of us, the world, coming within a hair's distance of nuclear catastrophe. The famous one is Stanislav Petrov, 26th of September, 1983, um, in, in the middle of the strategic defensive initiative, in the middle of the possibility of being attacked, and that year there had already been some uh, uh, posturing of that kind, where the early warning system of the Soviets warned that there were five incoming ballistic missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, coming their way. And it was, it was his decision not to react, not to say it to his uh, superiors. Because if he said, nobody would have contradicted him, that he thinks that this was an error. If he had not done that, the, co the, the consequences would have been catastrophic. There are other examples. Mikhail Arkhipov, there's, there's on the side of, uh, of NORAD, there have been examples like that. So imagine an environment of distrust in such a framework where th there is ambiguity of intent of what is going on and combined with a much faster uh, speed of hypersonic mi missiles, much less time to react to given circumstances. And the fact that it's not just top brass that decides on some things, but very often it is you know, officers who are below who need to make a decision, sometimes with nuclear weapons, sometimes with other types of weapons. So this type of ambiguity can be quite disastrous and uh, have a chain effect of actions and reactions that can be destructive in a, in a, so do I think, yeah, unfortunately I do. I just hope that we're wise enough to think about especially weapons of mass destruction and to allow for forms of communication that uh, put such uh, ambiguity to the side or at the very least uh, increase the possibilities of communication and at the very least not disintegrate existing forms of communication for that. Uh, JD, I'll ask you, since you uh, have, have more counterterrorism experience and other things like that, can evidence uh, be trusted anymore? I mean, we all uh, learned about the Cuban Missile Crisis and Adlai Stevenson at the United Nations presenting uh, surveillance photos of Cuba uh, in a somewhat uh, less triumphant way, Colin Powell presenting evidence of uh, WMDs in Iraq. Uh, will we ever face a situation where the world can sit at the Security Council, see irrefutable evidence of wrongdoing by a state, and, and not wonder if it's faked or uh, somehow manufactured for a certain purpose, even if it's not manufactured by the people who are presenting the case, that it could have been faked at another point in the process. Uh, how bad is this problem? <laughs> Um, I, I think that's a that's you know really at the at the core of this, right? Um, you know, are we turning this corner where all information has to be second guessed? Um, I think I think information in, in these uh, particular cases, when we're talking about weapons of mass destruction, for example, ha has always been second guessed. Um, so in that sense, we're in a good place. <laughs> um, but I am worried that uh, as the technology increases uh, in sophistication, for example, with the, the evolution of natural language generation, um, we are going to be in a place where our reaction time uh, is necessarily much more shortened. 
Um, and we're, we're going to have to find new processes to react to that information, and I don't think we're there. Siobhan, you've been uh, in the United Nations. Uh, is there a way that the global community can come together and uh, in institute procedures that will, will prevent some of these misunderstandings? Well, first of all, many of such mechanisms exist. Uh, the very fact that I chair this group of governmental experts, which is under what is called the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. It is an opportunity for legal and technological and military personnel from each country to come and to be able to signal to each other, to be able to share communication. And in the very fact that something is not said, something is said. So even in those environments. So I think that there are already uh, those uh, fora for, for discussion. And it is ludicrous for me. So last year, I ch when I chaired the Biological Weapons Convention, I had to uh, address the financial uh, problem of the convention. And I did, I put together an information paper. The Biological Weapons Convention costs a total of $1.5 million. The Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons costs a total of $1.5 million. And this is under threat of it becoming uh, uh, non-existent or failing because of tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, that's to me a ludicrous proposition. So. At the very least, we should have, we have to find ways to keep these fora for discussion because they are so important and certainly create new ones as needs arise and then be agile enough to create them and, 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 and keep a conversation going. But the underlying point is let's keep the conversation going because the danger is that everybody kind of goes back to their garages or, or whatever it is, starts thinking and creating all kinds of tools based on new technologies uh, with imagining what the potential adversary is doing instead of communicating and being at the center of it in, in whether it is in Geneva or in New York or Vienna or, or wherever it is here, uh, wherever in the world there's an opportunity for countries to engage with other actors and see exactly to fill them out and not just at the summit level, not just at the highest level of government, but at all levels of government. While we continue the conversation in about five or ten minutes, we're going to start uh, taking questions from the audience, but in the form of uh, emails. Uh, we're going to test the technology. Uh, you can email questions to moderator at panel.chat. That's moderator at panel.chat. They were supposed to put it up on the board and it may be up there somewhere, but uh, there it is. Uh, so uh, start thinking about your questions and uh, we will we'll move to that phase a little uh, in a few minutes. Uh, Michael, you have written a book about Russia's interference in the uh, 2016 presidential election. We've also heard many, many other instances of Russia interfering in other countries' elections, certainly throughout Eastern Europe. Major Russian disinformation campaigns and things like the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner by forces that were allied with Russia. Uh, and finding ways to sort of uh, uh, muddy the waters and sow misunderstandings. How much of this is a Russia problem? Well, look, we've seen plenty of evidence that, you know, it's not just the Russians. I think uh, Microsoft uh, recently uh, uh, discovered Iranian um, efforts uh, um, of disinformation in the United States. Uh, there's been instances of, uh, you know, North Koreans, but also, it, you know, it's, it's not just <laughs> state actors. There are plenty of non-state actors, foreign and domestic, um, who uh, can use the, 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 the Russian playbook in 2016 um, uh, for, the same, um, uh, for the same purposes. But I have to say, you know, as bad uh, and as disruptive as what the Russians did in 2016, it seems to me that uh, the dangers down the road are even greater. And you know we've heard a lot of talk uh, on this panel and earlier about deep fake uh, technology and uh, uh, how videos uh, can be manipulated with artificial intelligence to have people saying things they never said, um, but uh, uh, presenting it in uh, realistic ways. Think about um, uh, next year's presidential election in the United States and uh, going to the last days, or the last day of the election, 
uh, in which there's a deep fake video showing one of the candidates saying something truly outrageous that he or she never said. You pop that at the last minute, you put it on social media, it looks totally realistic, and what think about the impact that something like that can have. Uh, and it seems to me it far exceeds what we saw in 2016. Um, that be, that's a real, truly nightmare scenario for uh, uh, democracies around the world uh, for the way in which elections uh, can be disrupted. And um, yes, uh, the Russians could do it, uh, but also plenty of other uh, uh, actors out there, uh, state actors and non-state actors, uh, can perfect these techniques and um, uh, really disrupt our democratic process. I think that, uh, just to complement that, I think that the, more e the even more dangerous scenario to that is what you said about your interview with Assad. The, and, and that is that this actually gives the uh, credible way of, of, of many politicians, authoritarian or otherwise, of coming out of certain issues, to making everything relative to saying, well, everything can be fake right now, and, the, and this is fake, and so all of a sudden, it's not just that, that this can influence in the last minute, it's the fact that everybody can now say, this, this was fake, this is, there's no truth to this, and, and all of a sudden, there's no standard for what is real and what is not. So I think that that's an even more dangerous development than just the ability of influencing elections in a given specific point. Well, this, this is such a powerful weapon, and it's been so effective for Russia, as we've uh, seen in advancing its interests. Um, three of the panelists all uh, have worked at various points for their governments, for all three different countries. Uh, would you advise your government that this is such, powerful, uh, such a powerful disinformation technology that, that, that uh, you know, you have to be working on it? You know, there has to be somebody in the... U.S. government that is uh, tracking disinformation and ways that uh, the United States could could use it to its advantage, or Macedonia could use it to its advantage with some of its neighbors, or in the Gulf where we've seen so much uh, disinformation already and a blockade that has resulted partly from uh, social media or and uh, or hacking from hacking. Uh, do you all think that your own country should be in on this? I think when it comes to misinformation, uh, I, th I, I do believe that the responsibility is for the whole world because usually information will be generated somewhere uh, outside a country and uh, will, uh, tra will transfer to this country. Uh, also, with, the, uh, with a lot of statistics indicate that uh, more countries are willing to spread information about, especially now it's become like a weapon, information about uh, other countries more than their own. So, so uh, what the uh, country should do, I do believe that uh, country cannot do it uh, by themselves. They can have, as, uh, as you said, the technology, they can have rule and regulation, they can have, uh, they, they can do, uh, prevent or to a little bit uh, dilute, but still, I do believe that this this might be a UN uh, uh, initiative where uh, misinformation or disinformation should be treated like because uh, you know if you look about disinformation, it is um, it's impacting the fourth, it's impacting the press and the press it is impacting it is. Usually, it will impact how we think, how we t how people will take uh, decision, how to uh, how and this is why it's not the responsibility of one country. And uh, when it comes, because I thought it would be inter interesting to uh, 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 this information been here since 1920, and uh, and uh, the. Uh, name itself, uh, disinformation was only introduced in 1945 during uh, the uh, during the Cold War, war. 
And did uh, misinformation has any impact in creating war? Personally, I don't think mis uh, disinformation will have an impact to create a war. It might impact the, I agree with you, the election. It might impact a impact, uh, lot of uh, user behavior. But uh, I'm not a war specialist. I don't understand anything in, in war. But, I, uh, but since it's been there, since 1990, uh, in the 20s, I understand now the tools, it's, it's different with AI than that can mimic uh, how I write. 100% and, and with social media that can reach all over the world. But still, will this impact war? I don't think so. Um, just a, a quick comment. I, I think um, you know, we've made some strong uh, uh, statements about the Im potential impact of deep fakes, um, natural language generation, AI-driven technologies. Um, but I, I also think it's important not to overstate the threat of these technologies. Um, deep fakes uh, are still in the cheap fake phase at this point. It is possible to go out and uh, develop your own deep fake um, for a couple bucks on the internet. But that deep fake is pretty junky, uh, not very convincing. Uh, as for natural, natural language generation, there's an organization called OpenAI that has released a very sophisticated AI-driven natural language generator, generator that enables you to develop uh, essentially news articles. You plug in 10 words and it'll generate an entire news article that has sophisticated quotes and att attributes, sources, and all that good stuff. Um, it's absolutely fa fascinating, but I don't think it's at this weaponizable state yet. Um, and if we look back at some of the cases of disinformation operations, which were intended to instigate actual behaviors, uh, those, uh, those operations didn't always work. Um, I don't think we as a society are as gullible uh, as our adversaries think we are. Um, we still have resistance to uh, some of these campaigns. We still have resistance to false information. So. Um, I don't want to give this sense of Armageddon yet. Um, you know, I would think the, uh, the, the, the Seth Rich story I told before is a pretty good example of just how gullible we, we are and can be, um, particularly in this world of social media where we're all in our own silos. We're all reading, the, looking at the Twitter feeds and the Facebook pages that reinforce our prejudices and that we block out anything that um, uh, contradicts that. And I think that's what makes this problem so much more sinister today. Yes, disinformation has been around for uh, a hundred years now. Back in the early 1920s, Henry Ford used to distribute uh, 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 copies uh, and write about in his newspaper copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, uh, which was a Russian forgery suggesting that the Jews controlled the world. World. Um, so, you know, there is a parallel there with um, what I was talking about earlier in the Russian plant on the Seth Rich case. The difference is um, how it's distributed today, the rapidity with which it's distributed, um, the way it, um, uh, you know, with the stratification of the media, um, with everybody, as I said, in their own silos, it seems to me it's a much more uh, dangerous problem than it's ever been before. So to answer your question, whether we're, would I, would I uh, advise my government on something like that? No, absolutely not. Um, I was director of communications in the foreign ministry, and I drafted the stra uh, strategy for public diplomacy some time ago. I, so I do think that a country should be, um, be able to uh, display its narrative, its own story to the world, and to be uh, smart about it, and, there, and to use technologies in, in order to do that. Uh, uh, but never to do it under false pretense and, and to spread this information. Um, you know, I think that for diplomats, there is this image, perhaps, that diplomats lie, don't tell the truth. A diplomat, good diplomats never lie. I mean, if a diplomat is in a, in a given core, uh, and if he or she lies within that core, that will spread like that, and that diplomat will lose credibility forever. I mean, you know, lifelong, and wherever he or she goes, this will follow that diplomat. The worst thing that you can have as an image as a diplomat is that you lie. 
So that I would say the same thing about a country. I think that if I were to, I, and I do ad, uh, advise a government, I think it is best to present yourself long term as a champion of, 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 of so if, if there is a policy and if this is becoming an issue, why not become an international champion of good communication, of, of truth, of objectivity, of, 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 all, of all those aspects. I think that the, the other way around. But should we use technologies to promote ourselves? Certainly, that's within, we, uh, we have several questions from the audience here that we can run through. One of them is actually related to what you were just saying, uh, Jivan. Uh, the uh, question is, can disinformation be justified to achieve a common good? An example is using fake news to encourage people to participate in charity, for example. Any thoughts on that? Go a little further? Nobody, disinformation to help good cause? I'll tell, take, a, tell a heartbreaking story that may not be totally true, uh, but get people excited about giving? From, from my earliest days as a psychological operations team leader, the, the underlying principle of all influence activities has been to tell the truth um, and to never use uh, falsehood in your, in your narratives. It's a very dangerous, slippery path, and it always comes back to bite you. Uh, that's what the Russians are going through right now. Um, they use so much falsehood that it's, a, it's essentially destroying their reputation. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, we also have a question. Um, what is the State Department doing to counter the disinformation emerging from the Turkey-Kurd conflict since Trump's decision to withdraw troops? I think uh, this, this question relates to uh, there have been some, some questionable videos coming out of some of the Kurdish groups uh, whether they are in fact showing atrocities by Turkey or not, whether they're real, whether they were doctored to try to, um, you know, get the world community rallied behind the Kurds. Um, uh, I think you as the representative of the State Department, not that, not that you are uh, able to speak for the State Department, but do we right, know I, of any, uh, any I, ways to control those, uh, you know, what technologies perhaps that could test some of those videos? I mean, I can only speak for the Global Engagement Center's perspective on it. And, you know, we're not in that mode of, again, doing one-for-one -one refutation of disinformation and propaganda at this point. So I don't, I don't have a good answer to that question. Sorry. I, I would just point out, um, we had uh, just uh, the other day, ABC News airs video of what it presented as um, uh, from uh, the front in, in, in um, northern Syria, an attack on the Kurds by the Turks. It turned out it was actually a video uh, from some pyrotechnics in Kentucky made several years ago. This is a truly scandalous uh, uh, thing for uh, ABC News uh, if um, the public cannot trust the video it's being presented at home as coming from uh, the actual conflict in Syria. Um, it undermines the coverage that um, all news organizations are doing. So um, um, anyway, I, I think that's, um, you know, we all have to, and, and, and by the way, ABC News uh, owes the public uh, a full accounting of how that happened, and thus far it has not done so. Well, it's a sad reality, as, uh, as Yvonne was suggesting a little bit earlier, that you, you can't trust these things. I mean, we can all think of those uh, photographs of the, the dead children uh, in Syria, the dead Syrian children in the water, and uh, those kinds of things that sort of struck at the conscience of the world, and yet there were a uh, large number of people online questioning whether those were real images or, or not. Um, okay, here's a question specifically for, uh, for Mr. Maddox. Um, could you elaborate on your slide about laziness versus limitations? Um, yeah, so um, there are essentially two, I don't know if I can go back to that slide. Um, but there are essentially two uh, studies out there, sorry, I can't go back, um, that are indicating that uh, people, uh, when they are encountering uh, information online, um, uh, are vulnerable to it for, for two potential reasons. One is that uh, they essentially are intellectually lazy. Um, they won't make the extra step of, uh, you know, 
thinking through the information and what is underneath it, uh, where its sources are, uh, and uh, the legitimacy of that information. Um, and then the other uh, assessment of how we are vulnerable um, indicates that uh, we essentially are caught in that so-called filter bubble um, where we uh, have limitations to the kind of information we will consume and we have an inherent bias toward uh, one kind of uh, narrative or another. In, the, in that case, I think, in the case of that study, I think it was really focused on um, liberal versus conservative media consumption in the United States. Um, well, we don't have any more questions from the audience, and that works kind of well, because we have about five minutes left. And I wanted to give everybody a chance, since you all, many of you came a long way to, uh, to, to make some points uh, before an international uh, group here. Um, what would be the one takeaway that you want people to, uh, to glean from this, from this panel? And uh, uh, let me start with you first, Javon. I think that within the international realm, and especially for security matters, and even more for, uh, as I said, weapons of mass destruction, it is critically important to be able to convey and understand intent. So to convey one's own intent and to be able to understand the intent of other actors. And if that becomes blurred, the security um, re repercussions of that can be uh, very, very dangerous for all of us. So it is our collective duty to keep on creating or keeping the existing fora for, for nurturing communication and the ability of countries to be able to convey intent through diplomatic signaling, even military posturing, which is better than the alternative of an absence of communication uh, and uh, a fertile ground for, for this information. And with that, I really want to thank uh, the organizers for this amazing opportunity uh, to have this discussion. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, uh, vigilance, I think, is the uh, best um, antidote to um, the problems we've been talking about. Vigilance and transparency. Um, uh, I mentioned before uh, um, uh, the ABC News fiasco of running, um, uh, you know, false video about the, uh, the Syrian uh, conflict. Um, uh, and the importance of, uh, of of transparency by the news organization. How did we screw up like this? How did we present fake news to you? And I think the more news organizations can do that, the more transparent they can be about their own process and the real uh, editorial rigor and uh, fact checking that does go into real news, I think uh, is uh, one way that can distinguish um, real news from fake news. Um, I think uh, fake news will increase the polarization, distrust, and will decline the democracy. But I'm a big believer there was a, a very good report that was published two years ago by Bo. And in that report, what they did, they brought around 100 journalists and they grew and they asked them, what do you think the future of the fake news? Will it will really have an impact or, or with, te with technology and other things, there will be a limitation? And uh, the finding of that report is very interesting. 50% of the journalists and of the media specialist, uh, their response was, fake news will be even worse, it will impact uh, everything and will be very hard to control. The other 50%, uh, their response was with the technology, with, with the good part of the human, with the regulation, with the awareness, uh, fake news or disinformation can be controlled. So I belong to the second group. I do believe that with technology, with uh, awareness, with education, with, uh, the, uh, with, uh, with regulation, uh, disinformation can be controlled. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for um, having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I would just emphasize that 
Um, yes, this is a significant problem. I think the significant problem that we have to confront immediately. Um, but I also think that there are some very concrete tools that are useful right now against this problem. Um, and the ones I think we'll see uh, that will help us see immediate results are the, are the tools that are put in the hands of information consumers um, for their passive use. And if we can get those online at scale, we'll be in a much better position than we are right now. Well, thank you. Well, thanks to all four of you for uh, this wonderful sort of wide-ranging discussion that provides a, a, a very clear look at the dimensions of the problem that uh, we're going to be discussing in so many ways over the next couple of days. Um, so thank you, and thank you to all of you in the audience and the people who submitted questions. Uh, it's been an honor to be here. Can't wait for the rest of the uh, presentation. And now we'll break for lunch. Thank you.